Hello, welcome back to Aidajo Live and to our workshop on the Bach Cello Suite. Today, Prelude from the Second Suite. And it is a very special workshop for me today because our guest is somebody who has inspired me since uh, the very first time I heard him and ever since. And uh, he has been one of my idols, and he is one of my idols. And uh, this is Stephen Isolis. He will be with us in about uh, 15 to 20 minutes, but I think I will today try to cut it short and make it really 15 minutes, uh, because I received a lot of messages on uh, social media that you were all very excited to see and hear him. And um, I have to confess something. Uh, uh, Stephen was just trying, um, first of all he has proposed and uh, agreed to bring his cello with him, so he will actually play something for us as well, some examples. And uh, he was just trying the sound now, um, you know, of, to prepare for this, uh, for the workshop. And guess what he was playing? He was playing the beginning of the prelude of the second suite. So. Um, that's a bit intimidating, but I also seeing, uh, see it as a very as a great chance of inspiration. So I would like, uh, like we did a few times in the past, to start uh, this workshop with some questions that you sent me, um, and some of them are directly related to this prelude. And the first one, the first question is by Heather Mosley, who has been following our workshops very closely, and. Um, uh, Heather is asking, what are your thoughts on the rhythmic structure and hierarchy of the beats in the D minor prelude? The second beat seems very important. Is it too much to say it alludes to the sarabande? Is this common for Bach to use 3-4 beats uh, like this in movements outside of sarabande? And I would add to this question by Heather a question by Jeffrey who is asking, how do you feel about approaching the D minor prelude by eliminating all bar lines and apply rubato all across in a melodic, linear fashion? Sort of like a singer would uh, be expanding and, con con and contracting their voice. So, and uh, my answer to Jeffrey would be that um, I think that probably 90% of the Baroque music and probably in 90% of the music in general, in the history of music, the, the greater lines need also the smaller elements, the smaller bits and the bar lines have to be treated in a way that they construct larger lines, but we do need I think, uh, to go back now to the question of Heather, that I think we do need this 3-4 feeling quite strongly and, uh, and that Bach does use it very much, quite strongly, as a compositional tool. Um, first, the last part of the question of Heather, uh, we, have, we do have quite uh, many movements in 3-4. Of course, all the courants uh, are in 3-4, the menuets, of course, so it's not so rare. Now, about the relationship to the sarabande feeling, the sarabande uh, rhythm. Um, we talked about it, of course, in the sarabande of the first suite. What does the sarabande have? It has this attraction between the first and the second beat. And indeed, if we look at this prelude now, the whole prelude is constructed on a quite simple uh, element of three notes, which is constructed on the first and the second beat. And remember, we talked about it in the first prelude, how Bach, with a simple element, will then construct something. Well, uh, in the first prelude, he was constructing on these notes, on these famous first notes, but he was also having a lot of moments where uh, there was quasi-improvisation. The second half of the prelude, you know, with all these scales and everything, was not directly related to the material, to 
uh, to the, 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 the motive. And here, in this prelude, Bach goes much more systematically uh, uh, back all again and again and again on constructing this whole prelude on this, basically on this chord. I don't want to say on these three notes because it is three notes and immediately in the second bar it's five notes. So first bar, and then second bar. So we have already four notes in the chord plus a passing note. So, but it's always a chord that is presented uh, in this Sarabande-like rhythm between first and second beat. And um, again, this is going to be throughout the piece, as always, like he did also with our motive in the in the first prelude. It is sometimes the the, the basic presentation is from the bottom note. <laughs> again and the next bar also but in the fourth bar you already have the first occurrence where the, this chord and this 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 three note chord is presented from the middle note and we will see that later turning sometimes presenting this uh, um, this chord from different uh, sometimes from the soprano sometimes from the middle note will have uh, will help him to construct his, uh, his prelude. Uh, what we have, you remember also that in the first prelude, uh, Bach basically was starting down there, and then he was doing his cadenzas, his scales, the thing, and then he was rising and we finished in the sun. <laughs> with the, the motif uh, uh, turned around, from the top and we finished uh, right there well in this second prelude which has of course because of the key of d minor a totally different feel we will be rising but we will be rising actually three times and actually the the climax the the point where we actually get to this high register of the cello is not going to be the last word of this prelude. It's going to be basically in the middle of it. And, and from this high point, we will then go back to darker colors and, and have again um, um, some, some rising, but as we will see in a very, in a very different way. So um, I will play now a little bit and giving a few examples. So we have this first rise, and go back down of about, not about, of 12 bars. Uh, presentation of the theme. And now that we presented our key, our theme, we start our little journey. So always this chord on two beats. And this I find so charming. Bach has always such a compelling way to propose to us uh, this uh, sequence. Um, uh, and in this case, it's because he, he touches again uh, the, the, the former note, the note that belongs to the, to the former chord. Uh, before actually coming back, coming to the chord where we are. And now longer phrase. Bach likes to do after now giving us four bars that were in one line and and uh, and rising he comes down to the basic three notes now in F major 
and now you see we start a series of modulation that will again rise so we try again a, a, a second attempt of rising motif from the middle note high point of this phrase and how does he bring us back down for the second time now with again this I use this I know absolutely wrong term for this music of walking bass basically the bass becomes quite active to slowly bring us uh, back down in in four bars to to the to the lower register <laughs> So we came back down, come back to our element, but this time we start this phrase with a diminished seventh chord, which is a very different feel than having a, a D minor or F now It's as though we would immediately start with a question and with that we are looking for something. Yeah. So, and now here we will start quite immediately uh, an ascension that will bring us uh, to our dominant. And I want to say one thing about this passage, uh, because many of my students come um, and uh, bring these bars that uh, we are going to, to, to play now uh, with a wrong accentuation. <laughs> So, giving a, a, a heavy second beat, but a heavy second beat by itself, so, and, and with the argument, which I understand, which is to say, well, but the bass note is actually on the second beat, so we should bring it out. Well, remember now, we talked about it a few times now in the first suite, when a chord, a, a harmony is presented not from the bass, but from another note, this is where you should give actually your your attention your sound quality your contact with the string so in this case it's again it's our motif uh, our chord uh, our three note motif from the middle note and therefore you really need a, a very expressive now this was already quite an expressive moment and we reached our dominant so we could think we could think well that's it that was our uh, our climax of the piece no we are going to go down again and rise to a much more dramatic and expressive moment um, so so they <laughs> but on a so-called Napolitan chord, which gives something obviously expressive, but also reflexive, maybe. <laughs> so, and here, as you see, Bach went back as far down as it goes, you know. And he's spreading our motive, our three note motive. Now, as you can see, the intervals are much bigger. Huh? We started there. So always a little third. Here we have a sixth and a, and a, and a seventh. So we have a dominant seven, which is spread to give more expressivity. Uh, 
And he does it again. A diminished, quite dramatic chord. I want to go for one second to the piano here because what I find very interesting is how the, the harmonies that you hear now, just as this passage, which as I was uh, mentioning, are the same three harmonies that we had about eight bars before to, to, the, to the preceding high point. So, so you remember we... And then... Uh, this is these chords and they are here again presented like if Bach... It, so it gives us a feeling of Oh, we are doing again the same ascension, the same harmonies, but more spread, more to give more tension, to give more drama, and this is what prepares us. To the actual high point of the place, where of course we have our motive, but from the top this time, not from the middle note. <laughs> And then the only pause, the only uh, break, the only moment of silence in this prelude is after a chord actually pretty much as dison dissonant as goes in the Baroque times because you, you have a tritonus, you know. <laughs> the interval of the devil and so this creates the, the combination of this harmony and the, and the pause and the silence creates a great feeling of of expectation and of course of course what does uh, Bach do instead you know of uh, uh, sorry. sorry I did it again sorry. Get something like, you know, and of course, that's not what he does. The bass note stays where it is, and we have again this Napolitan chord that we had before, uh, which brings us back, which gives us a feeling that. Even when we go to this climax, even when we tell, we, we, we tell, I don't know, I want each of you to decide what feeling it is. I don't want, I'm afraid to put words on it because uh, you might have totally different words than me. Uh, Stephen will certainly have different uh, feeling of it, but maybe despair or something. But then there is also a sort of resignation. <laughs> And we go down and down and down. And now we have a, l a last uh, rise of four bars until the final cadence, but it's we almost don't rise, and not only this, but this. R slow rising is uh, contradicted in a way by always falling down lines of scale. We try again our motive, but we fall back. We try again. And then the famous last bars, uh, very, very famous last five bars of this prelude. I say very famous because for those of you who are not cellists, there is uh, this ever going uh, debate. Uh, and here we have the question, 
was asked, I think, let me see, somebody asked about the cadenza, yes, it was again Jeffrey who was asking regarding the final five bars of the prelude, when one writes their own cadenza, can the improvisation go beyond the range limit of the highest and lowest notes found within this prelude? Um, so, with, with, before going specifically to, to his question, so there is always this debate, just, should we just play these chords or should we do a cadenza? Um, I will again mention Anna Belsma, uh, my great mentor for, for this music, uh, who had, uh, as always, a, a way to, to explain his uh, decisions, his choices, uh, uh, with a lot of humor, and uh, he was he was saying he was explaining he thought that at this place we should do ornamentations, we should add notes, we should do melodic notes, uh, because probably what happened is that Bach was working, and then somebody knocked on the door, and he, he didn't have time to finish, so he just put the court, the last chord and he rushed to the door uh, to open the door. Uh, that was a, a typical Anna Belsma way to justify it because otherwise, everywhere in the suite, he was against ornamentation, so he had to justify himself for actually playing ornamentation at this place. And probably this place is the best transition uh, to call uh, our guest and ask him, ask you, dear Stephen, whether you play ornamentation, yes or no, and and uh, and uh, if you have a yeah what if you could tell us more about this dear Stephen, welcome hello 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 Stephen. yeah very hello. interesting Hang on. oh thank you it was very very intimidating for me to do this with uh, knowing that you were there but um yeah maybe we could start there Stephen, because because this is an ever going uh, yes. question debate about this this last bars what how do you see that well i loved annabelle's as well we used to meet and argue for hours and i would argue that one too it doesn't make sense because there are two manuscripts the kellner mm -hmm. manuscript and the anna magdalena bach manuscript are copied from different versions presumably both from bach and they both have the five chords and so do the other later 18th century manuscripts, although they're not, we don't know where they're copied from. Um, but Bach wouldn't have had two people come at the door. I think he wants those five chords. And my feeling, but it's very individual and it may be complete rubbish, is that this, the whole of the suites are scenes from the life of Christ and that those five chords represent the five wounds of Christ on the cross. Yeah, we had a, 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 excuse me, Stephen, I didn't want to interrupt, but, but just because uh, uh, Heather, who has been um, uh, following this, this workshop, she had a question specifically when she heard that you were going to be here today. She said, I remember hearing Stephen Isolis say uh, he sees the Swedes as two groups of three Swedes following something of the Christian message of birth, crucifixion, resurrection, despite these pieces being secular dances. Uh, yeah, so sorry. So basically, that's why you were, you were st starting to say about the, the crucifixion. The fact that the dances doesn't make them secular. So the Bieber mystery sonatas, they're all dances. That's, um, mm -hmm. so, you know, that's a dance, a Bach mm -hmm. dances to God. Yeah. Um, so that's just my feeling. That's the only way I used to do ornamentation. And I thought, why are those five chords there? Why does he write? The five chords, which, you know, it's not like the chicane where he set up a pattern and then he says, go on with the pattern. It's nothing like that. So, yeah, I think they should be called. But, I'm, you know, it's up to everybody. I used to do ornamentation. I did rather something quite nice. I can't remember what it was. Um, but, um, yeah, you can't say it's wrong, but it's very strange that it should be in both manuscripts. Oh, and by the way, in Kellner, it's... <laughs> He has an A at the base, which might have been Bach's first thought. I mean, it seems as if Kellner is copying from an earlier version of the Swedes than Anna Magdalena. So it's interesting that. Okay. Uh, Kellner could well have made a mistake. He makes many mistakes, so does she. Um, yeah. yeah, but, yeah. Um, you know, it is wow. interesting that, but he doesn't have the G in the base. Yeah, yeah, before, definitely. Before the B flat. Because um, I've, I've, I've often wondered, um, with this G, uh, because 
how do you see it? If we play the G down there, do you think there is an, an implicit even lower A? Because we, we are still on our, on our dominant pedal, no? Yes, I mean, it's, I don't know, it's still a dominant chord. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And I would completely agree with you with people who accent the second beat because the bass seems to change that. No, it changes on the first beat. He just, he doesn't, you don't hear it. I mean, you hear it in your head, in fact. But he doesn't mm -hmm. sound the note. And that's, uh, I remember saying to Franz Bruggen, how, how can you explain what's so miraculous about the Bach Suites? And he said, it's the hidden bass line. Mm -hmm. So the bass line, for me, it's so useful to play it at the piano, this prelude in particular, I think. Play it always on the piano and just put in the mm -hmm. bass line, because it's mm -hmm. there. It's yeah, not yeah, yeah, just yeah. implied, it's, it's there, it's just not sounded. That's what gives us actually the drive, no? That's what shows us the way. It shows us the dynamics, it shows us the length of the phrase, it shows us everything, really. Mm -hmm. the, the bass line, rather sweet. In regard to this, do you, um, uh, sometimes, I mean, rarely, but sometimes in, in repeats, at some places, I, I allow myself to put a little bass line that is, as you say, in, implied and that is not, not, not composed by Bach. Is it something that you that, that you do sometimes, or do you find it uh, childish? <laughs> no, I neither. I don't usually do it, but I don't think it's wrong. You know, and, mm -hmm. there's, and there are. I mean, presumably, if you looked at the Kellner as well, I sort of alternate between the Magdalena mm -hmm. Bach and the Kellner, because that has some extra extra bases. Mm -hmm. Quite a few, mm -hmm. actually. Yeah. Uh, extra chords and things. So, you know, it's, in that way, I think you're fairly free to do it. I don't yeah, yeah. perform these suites anymore because it's scaring me so much, but, but I'm working on them and doing this time just for my own pleasure. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, it's the, the bass line is really, I think that's, that's what we're so useful for people who play the piano or have a piano, just to play every mm -hmm. group on the piano, putting mm -hmm. in the bass line. And that will show you the direction, it will show you the dynamics. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I have talking because you you mentioned these uh, these different sources and sometimes different notes and everything and now I would like to make a little uh, um, uh, jump to the fifth suite because there we we really have the version we, we have the version by Bach uh, the manuscript of Bach for the for the lute version obviously and and there of course as we know there are all these uh, uh, there is many more. Uh, 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 baseline notes yeah. that, that, that are there. But I wanted to ask you about this thing which I still uh, I find so 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 extreme in the way. So we know that when he was doing uh, harmonizing the same choral uh, three or four times, he would do three or four different harmonization. So uh, and, and there is this absolutely enormous example at the, with the last chord of the prelude, which is uh, for us cellists, uh, a wonderful tiers Picard and finishing, you know, like in, in this, in, in a glorious way, in a way, you know, like, ah, oh, yes, we have, you know, we have played our little fugue, but nevertheless our fugue. And, and in the, in the lute version, it stays in minor. So, and I find this such a, do you think he was just playing with us? Like, like going I once in... Playing with us, I think, because the lute gives such a different atmosphere, it can't have the dynamics that the cello can have. It can't end with the same, you know, amount of drama. It can be different. I mean, he's such a practical composer, Bach. I mean, all those chords in the sixth suite, it's not just because they're five strings. It's also because he knows that a five string cello, the bridge will be different. It's easier to play chords because the, you know, the spacing between the strings is more narrow. I mean, he's incredibly practical. There's no, I mean, you know, even the first prelude, it's the most perfect use of the cello ever. And he's very, I think it's an instrumental thing, that. The, just to pick it, it on, the, on the lute, it might sound disappointing. Whereas on the cello, it sounds dramatic. Um, yes, sorry, I, had, I, I got the, the technical advice from Eric, our technician. I greet him that I should put myself on mute when you speak because apparently I, I'm making some strange noises here. Um, so, so <laughs> um, Stephen, two, well, two things. First of all, I'm thinking we, we have the chance to have you here. You brought your cello with you. So I, 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 I can't imagine that I'm going to make you talk all the time and we are not going to. Yeah, so if there, 
I just feel comfortable with my cello. <laughs> We're not black. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but it would be wonderful. But uh, see, see, okay, if we are still in the talk, I have a very uh, down to earth, not directly, well, actually, Bach related question by Laia Puig on Instagram. She sent me this, uh, a very simple question. She's, she's a cello teacher and she says most of her students, of her uh, pupils, uh, get a totally blocked left hand when they play Bach how how can one keep a free left hand so i know i'm sorry to bring you to, to such uh, secular <laughs> questions and which are things i i am also going to 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 talk about it and but for me beyond being the one of the most inspired musician uh, that you uh, that you are you are also the one no but let's let's i think every cellist on this planet agrees that in terms of uh, just Playing cello like breathing, <laughs> you you are are uh, our idol. So, do do you have any something that you can say about this about this left hand getting tense? You know when Not we play much, the switch. Because if I am relaxed and natural, it's because I was taught that it was easy to play the cello and never to think about it. So I never really think about it. Um, But I think what you just said is super important. Yeah, because and it's the mindset, I think. If you start thinking, how am I going to make my fingers less tight? They'll get tighter. If you think about the music, hopefully, and maybe that's, you know, that's why I don't accept regular students. Maybe that's not, not helpful. But I feel that often, you know, if you're thinking about the technique, the technique will come, become difficult. And for me, relaxation is the most important part of technique. And therefore, if you're thinking about the music, I mean, it's like, for instance, an example I often use is Dvorak concerto, the octaves in the first moment. And if you think, oh, I've got to play octaves, you'll mess them up. And even if you don't, you'll miss the point. So you do mess them up musically. If you think, oh, it's coming, the recapitulation is coming, it's, we're getting there, we're getting home. Then suddenly the octaves become much easier and they, it doesn't matter if you don't miss them. That's not, not the point. The point is you get the excitement of coming to the recapitulation with the second subject, um, which is a surprise in itself. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think, For me, but maybe that's not helpful, or well, it's only helpful for a very small proportion of people. I'm no, I think you teach, and I don't. <laughs> no, no, I think I think it is very helpful, and I think you started right putting the finger on it because um, more and more with my students, I, uh, I've been we have been talking about this, and I've been telling them that I think that the only actual way to to overcome problems, I mean, like, like, like uh, these challenges, these things, whatever, is to actually say, oh, to look at it differently. It's not a problem. It's actually not right. And, and, and to, to realize that to also, for example, shifts. For example, for me, shifts have not always been, you know, uh, so easy, and I still have to practice them a lot, to, to practice them a lot. <laughs> but but um, to, to remember that putting your hand here or here is actually, it's not, in a way, it's not a big deal. And, and we have to learn that it's not a big deal. So I think, I think uh, that's, that's, that's wonderful and it's going to be very helpful uh, for our viewer. Uh, the, um, one more question, if I may, uh, that comes uh, again from Heather. She was very inspired. She sent me a very long text. Um, I, I, sorry, but just before you do that, I, I agree with her. It's unusual because I second beat to be so important mm -hmm. outside of a saraband. But I don't think it is anything like a saraband. Mm -hmm. Much more sort of, you know, it's important because that's the motive. That's the, um, you don't have sarabands sort of going up in quite the same way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sarabands, the first and second tend to be equal, usually. And here, it's rising to the second beat, which is not like a saraband. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Anyway, I'm, no, I'm very happy you, you clarified that. And uh, um, uh, that's, I mean, that, that, that's that just doesn't sound like a... To me, it doesn't sound like a saraband. Immediately, it sounds more like an aria or a meditation. Mm -hmm. I mean, not that the saraband mm -hmm. can't do a meditation, but it doesn't sound like a dance. Mm -hmm. So at the most, one could just say that the relationship, if there is, is that, is that 
we go from the first to the second beat and and yeah. and that's yeah. it yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah 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 um uh, so heather also said i know Isalis talked about finding it difficult to perform bach well I, I didn't know that and uh, uh, that she, she read this somewhere and she says how is the solitary nature of the suites both inspiring and intimidating for you for most of us cellists we play Bach a lot at home and rarely in public for me I find it the best thing to play to find a good connection to my cello to perform them sometimes feels very long, lonely and uncomfortable. How do you deal with that, especially playing all six suites together? So, um, a lot of questions in there. I don't know if you want to, to catch on, your, on what... Because, as I say, I just don't perform them anymore because I just get scared. I get scared of memory lapses. And, um, so I thought, you know, it won't make me love the suites or enjoy them any less if I don't play them in front of people. So I just stop playing them in front of people. Uh, but myself, Stephen, it's, if, 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 if I may, it's such, it's such a pity for us. And, and, and what do, everybody, uh, uh, Isabel Faust, now when she plays the Bach Partita and Sonata, she plays always with the score. No, she does. She, she, she plays I always with the score. I'd rather not do it. I think maybe yeah. I'll change my mind. I might be well. doing actually some private concerts just for something to do in July. Maybe I'll play a couple of Bach suites there, but it's a very small group of people. Um, Okay, so I'll tell secretly to, to our viewers to write uh, uh, messages uh, on Twitter to, to Stephen to uh, push him and, and <laughs> to play them again for us. I did them again. I, did, I said I wouldn't do it. And then John Gilhooly at the Wigmore persuaded me to do it one more time. And so I did it. Oh, it's such suffering for me. I was just so nervous. I felt like, you know, going on. The thing is, I did it in two evenings, which I think you did too, right? In two evenings. And I felt... <laughs> You know, it was like going on to the scaffold to be, or to the guillotine to be executed, except I had to do it twice. <laughs> mm -hmm. so. You know, when, when, uh, when I do them in two evenings, what I find difficult is the beginning of the second evening to come back because the journey has been a bit, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I agree. Be, yeah, because there is something no about about these six weeks that take you on this journey, and then suddenly, okay, pause. Uh, you go sleep. You go. You have breakfast. You 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 go shopping, uh, and then you come back to the restaurant, and then you start the story in the middle. I find this uh, quite quite challenging. I must yeah, say. I mean, I think the order is is a slight problem because ideally you do one, two, three, four, five, six, but you can't do four, five, and six in one concert. Apart from that, I would never start with the fourth suite. But, um, but then one concert's much too short, one's much too long. So mm -hmm. I used to do, what did I do? One, five, four, two, no, that can't be right. Maybe I can't remember the third one. Um, but I think probably, anyway, I remember starting the second one, two. Um, no, mm -hmm. that's right, sorry, one, five, four, three, two, six. That's right. mm -hmm. So you had the minor in the middle. Mm -hmm. Because it's very interesting that it does seem to be two sets of three with Bach suites. Mm -hmm. It is major, minor, major, major, minor, major. But then he sort of puts it in hemiola because you have minuet, minuet, bure, bure, gavot, gavot. And he's telling you it's not just three and three. Mm -hmm. it's, it's three and three and one, two, three, four, five, six. Mm -hmm. A set mm -hmm. of six. <laughs> wow, I never thought of that. That he actually put the miola even in the in the way he is putting the the movements. Amazing, <laughs> amazing. Yeah. What's really interesting, Kelma, the fifth suite, there's mm -hmm. no saraband. Maybe he left it on there's only a few bars of the jig. If he was writing from an earlier version, it's just not impossible that Bach couldn't think of a saraband and thought of it later. I don't know. It's possible. Wow. Thank God this Sarabon exactly. exists. Can Thank you God. imagine? And like, well, luckily we would have, we would have constructed it with, from Lou, but we would have had lots of chords and things. We would have done a completely different version. Yeah. Constructed from it. So thank God for Anna Magdalene. Oh, yes. God for her. Yes. <laughs> 
Oh, well, um, I don't know if we have a few minutes left. I hope so. Well, usually Eric then writes me a, a message saying uh, that we have to stop soon. Uh, he says yes. Okay, I have one one more minute. So, uh, a few more minutes. Um, there is uh, Josquin who has also been following um, uh, this this workshop uh, and sending me many questions. Um, so it's more a question. He he says. Uh, so he he wrote me in French, and I'm going to translate uh, in English as good as I can. I had the impression that more than any other uh, works, the suites are subject to controversy in the interpretation. Uh, each cellist has uh, his or her version, uh, and 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 that it, it gets and that people get very critical, you know, of the of the style, of the aesthetic, and the approach of the other people. Um, why is it so? And he's asking why have this suite become at the same time so universal? You know, like uh, Rostropovich at the Berlin Wall, Casals there, and everything, but uh, at the same time they crystallize, uh, one has the, in the cello repertoire, the strongest opinions and, and uh, you know, fight, like in competitions, you know, that, that, uh, that people, uh, that's what, that uh, what young, stu young um, players who go to competitions, that's what they are really afraid to play at the competition, because they, they know there is going to be in the jury someone who really says, no, you can't play Bach like this, you know. So I don't know, what's, what's your view on this? Well, it's, it is true. If anybody asks me what they should send on an audition tape for Russia Kovac, he told me I said, don't send Bach. Because it's often true, I hate it. Some of them. And then if I love it, of course, that's great. That's really special. And it has happened. But I just feel anytime I hear a theory or an idea coming through the performance, it bothers me. I don't want to hear it. I mean, you know, I say I have this idea that they illustrate the life of Christ, but I never let that sort of you know, dictate how I'm going to phrase something. Um, Bach is, I mean, the reason the suites are so, are so universally loved is they have everything. They have so much humor, they have so much tragedy, they, they're just so perfect, in, but in a very human way. It's such a human message, this music. Um, and if I hear a theory, if I hear somebody, you know, it's great if people understand the harmony, but just don't point it out to us, we can hear. You know, we don't, we want to be a sort of, like a window, a, a clear window. We can see Bach through it. We don't want to be opaque. We don't want to sort of get in the way. And I think many people do get in the way. You don't, which is great. And you and I have always been allies anyway. Uh, <laughs> but, I mean, many performances, I can say, oh, yes, we know you're clever. We know you've read a book about the rock practice. Let's say, I want to hear some Bach. I want to hear the music as you would sing it in the shower. That's exactly, it's got to be natural. It's such natural music. You know, what could be more natural than just one line, or one instrument? Yes, it's wonderful. Um, and, but, but as you said, and, and this I say for, you know, young cellists who are still looking, well, we are looking our whole life <laughs> for what we want to do with this music, but, um, uh, but for young cellists who are, you know, still looking for what their Bach could be, as you mentioned before, to get to this simplicity and to not be finger pointing in interpretation, nevertheless, you have to go in the language, analyze, understand, look for the baseline and, yeah. and, and do all this work. It's not complicated music and it's dance music. Even the prelude, as I said, it was not a saraband, but it's still, even that prelude, which is the most lyrical, well, that, that and the fifth, there's always a sense of dance. You know, and unless Bach is writing a chorale or recitative, there's dance there. And that makes, should make, I think, the rhythm simple. And, you know, mm -hmm. and then you have to know the di metric accents of the different dances. Yeah, and of course, they'll each have, you know, that's what makes even the sixth Alemand an Alemand, because it has that one, two, three, four, one, which all the Alemands have, and, you know, whatever, and the Saraband with it. Second beat, but not stronger than the first beat. First beat is always, and that second question you say, no, you always have to know where the bar line is. It's always very important. You can go against it, you have to know where it is. You have to feel, without pointing, you have to feel that that's where the, the dancer leaves the floor and comes back very often, very often, first beat. Um, 
and but it, it is simple music. As I say, what could be simpler than one instrument? And to to understand the harmonies is just understanding the language, the journey, the story, um, and that's all. And to, you know, just understand the story. You don't you don't bring out once upon a time there was a princess. You know, once upon a time there was a princess. It's natural, and the Bach suites are just as natural as that, and they're all stories, different stories. They have every emotion there is in them. Wonderful. Once upon a time, there was a princess, so I think that's a wonderful uh, image to <laughs> to say goodbye. Unfortunately, we have to stop. Stephen, I'm so grateful that you took this Thank time. You. Thank you so much. It was wonderful to see you again at the moment, this time at distance. I hope soon we can see you again. Uh, uh, yeah. each other in real and um, dear viewers next episode will be on friday and coming friday seven o'clock and my guest will be flutist emmanuel payu so we will hear what he has to say about the bach cello suite thank you so much